Backlighting to create interest. I love this technique. Sorry, I didn't mean to freak you out there. That was kind of loud. I love though this technique because backlighting is one of my favorite things to do to simply turn a scene that looks completely ordinary into something absolutely extraordinary. And that is your job as a photographer. The more often that you can do that in front of a client and you go, see, look at what this looked like before and now look. And then they look at the back of your camera and you're like, holy cow, that's amazing. You're absolutely fantastic. You're magical. And that's the exact thing that you want. Now we all know, we all know there's no magic here. It's all about the light. Well, that is kind of magical. Lighting is magical in general. So when does backlighting in these types of scenes work out for your benefit? We generally want to backlight and create a rim light, typically when we want to do one of two things. One is to create separation between the subject and the background. So for example, if our subjects have dark hair and the background is dark, then backlighting them can create that separation. Now we want to make sure that we don't go too far because if you go too far, it just looks like their hair is on fire. And that's generally not a look that you want unless we're talking about lighting 401 or lighting 301 and 401 where we made Michelle's hair look like it caught on fire, which was kind of a cool effect. All right, that's on my mind right now because we just shot that yesterday. But, so that separation is one thing. Point number two, when we want to backlight, is when we have, basically, for lack of a better term, actually this is a pretty good term, this is like a scientific term, airborne particles. Whenever you have airborne particles, generally backlighting is gonna create really cool and interesting and dynamic effects in your image. What are airborne particles? Well, for example, water. If it's raining, if you have a fountain, like in this case, if you have some sort of a spray, we'll oftentimes take spray bottles on shoots and we'll create our own mist and our own rain, which we're gonna to get to in Lighting 301. Anytime you have fog or smoke or anything like that, if someone's smoking and taking a drag on a cigar, if you put a light behind that smoke, that smoke just like blooms and it looks absolutely incredible. So anything with these airborne particles, the first thing I want to pop into your head is what would that look like if I backlit it? And to keep things simple and straightforward, take a look at this. This was shot with the Sigma 50 millimeter art at 1 100 of a second at f1.4 and ISO 200 at 4000 Kelvin. This is just exposing for that natural ambient light here. You can see that the flash did not fire. We have that kind of, we have this really cool curved fountain in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, that sometimes is on, sometimes it's off. It's kind of hit or miss. But when it's on, it looks fantastic. So I placed a couple inside of it, and that's that shot. And I actually took that shot. I do this all the time. I'll take that shot and then I'll turn the flash on. The flash is already placed behind them. I already got everything set up. I did the test shot already. It's all set up and good to go. But once we turn that flash on, then look at what happens to that background. We go from this to this. Now this isn't a generally a shot I would take on a real engagement session, unless I was trying to show a tutorial. But this is, why? Because what I do is I go, look at this. Check this out. This is, this is what that scene looks like right now as you see it. And I show them that image. And I go, but watch what happens when I take the picture of the scene. And then I show them this. And then of course they go, holy cow! That's absolutely amazing. And that's what we want. So, what have we done here? Well, for composition and attributes, I used, the first thing on my mind is I wanna use a shallow, shallow to the field. And the Sigma 50 millimeter art lens, I have the 85 right now on. This is not the art, but it's still a great lens but their art series is absolutely incredible. Talk about lenses that are tack sharp, even when shooting wide open. So f1.4 is wide open. You don't get any wider than that, at least not on that lens. And uh, it's still a tack sharp image. And I wanted that because I want the bokeh effect in the water. I want the depth in the water where we have small bokeh effects in the back and we have larger bokeh effects in the front water. And we have this soft overall look to the image. I want that. So that's the first thing that pops into my mind is I want that because I need that effect for the water. Well, now that we're shooting, this shot is taken basically in a kind of dusk. So it's not pitch black outside, but it's dark enough. We're in an area that's like under shade too. So it's fairly dark. So we don't need to worry about sync. We don't need to worry about high speed sync or neutral density filters. And what we're doing is we wanna keep the ambient exposure fairly dim, okay? So we're at one 200th of a second in ISO 200. This is at one 100th of a second in ISO 200. So I, I basically sped it up by two stops. We went up to one 200th and then brought the ISO down to 100 for these shots. Why did I do that? Well, the thing is that you can quickly ruin a beautiful shot like this by allowing too much of this crappy ambient stuff in your background into your frame, right? It would make the background more busy. It would add a lot of green tones to it. It just wouldn't look great. 
So I want to deepen that and darken it. All we see in the background here is just, this is actually a storefront of a store that is completely empty. So we see cement and like the green lights and everything. It doesn't look good. So we darken it down by two stops so that we can barely see anything behind that light of, you know, what's going on here. Then we have our Fotex Mitros. It's placed at one eighth power. Uh, it's placed right behind the couple, and it's zoomed to around. You can go in, like you can go anywhere for this type of a shot to um, 80 to 105. You can go 50. I zoomed in around 80 millimeters, and you can see that based on how tight the hi highlight pattern is behind them. Why? Because I want to create a natural vignette in the image. Okay. So what that does is, depending on your zoom, if you want the entire image from edge to edge to be the same brightness, then you use a wide zoom. Okay, so at 24 millimeters, the zoom on this, it's just gonna, the light's just gonna fan out in every direction and it's gonna give you basically bright edge to edge. If you wanna get more of that kind of vignetted look, you zoom it in. And the further you zoom, the more of that vignette you're gonna get because essentially the light is going telephoto, right? It's tunneling down. We know that from Lighting 101. So we're zooming it in. Probably this is around 80 millimeters. We're at, at around 1 8th to 1 16th power. And again, this is the beauty of being able to use the Odin right on my camera because once that's placed and I have a couple there, I just make a couple quick adjustments up and down as necessary in the power till I get it to that point that I want it. Where do I want the brightness? I want it to where basically the hottest points in the image, the brightest points in the image are just behind the couple or just around their faces. And I don't want those points to be too blown out. So I, what I want to do is retain most of the color in the, the droplets. You'll know that you've gone too far if everything is just blowing out from edge to edge and you have too much, you know, you want to create that contrast. The contrast, the beauty of the image is created from having these bright points against a darker background. And if everything is just bright, then you don't get that beautiful contrast in there. So you want to make sure you get to that right power setting. We also don't want to create like a giant explosion behind them where it just looks like everything goes white. Okay. And then we do a couple different shots, a couple different angles. This is an example right here. So I love this shot. This was fantastic. We shot a couple different images. You know, when I'm doing shots like this, it's, it's all kind of when it comes to the pose, it's all about the profile and so forth. So we basically get them kind of closing in on each other, going for kisses, things where they're facing in and not looking to the camera because their faces obviously are not lit. So for the test shot, we revealed good power to around 1 16th. We already talked about making sure that it's not too powerful. Light color, we left the flashes without their gels on. Okay, so basically our flashes are shooting at 5,500 Kelvin. The ambient light around them is around 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So what did I do? I dropped the ambient, uh, I dropped our, um, white balance down to match the ambient light. So we're at 3000 Kelvin on this shot. And what happens is the background now, that 5500 Kelvin flash turns blue, okay? Now we can exaggerate this effect even more by putting even more yellow light on them and then pulling it down even more. But this effect is already great. I already like the look. I like where there's a little bit of warmth in their skin from that natural ambient light. And then we see that blue in the background. It looks absolutely fantastic. Okay, the couple is posed directly in front of the flash. And what I want to make sure that happens here is that essentially we want to pose the couple in the way where they block the flash. And so this is going to come down to the height of the flash. Generally, I found that the best height with a shot like this is matching to about the girl's shoulder height. So right about here, that way it's concealed just behind them. And I can basically put that light directly in between them and light where it's even light. What we want to make sure is that if the light is kind of pointing a little bit towards her, or if our camera angle is a little bit biased on one side, you end up with the, either a brighter highlight around the girl or a brighter highlight around the guy. And if it's too much, it can be too powerful. So what we want to do is place that flash just at a height where it's hidden behind where they're kind of connecting right there, aiming it up a little bit toward their faces and making sure that we choose an angle where that light is kind of hitting both of them fairly evenly on both sides of the face. Okay. Analyze and make sure that you don't have any unpleasant lighting on their faces. We showed you an image earlier when we were talking about basically slowing things down and, and, and looking at the details where we had a very unpleasant highlight that was hitting the side of her cheek and the chin and, and so forth. That was partly due to light direction and also due to camera angle. Correct those things. Adjust. Make sure that you have a nice rim light that outlines their shape and their body and their form, but it doesn't create unnatural and unwanted highlights in a way that looks unflattering. Okay. And that's it. We have their entire bodies covering everything. Now, when they do that, 
you end up with this beautiful high contrast image. And this is virtually directly from camera. We, I showed them this image and just blew their minds straight out of camera. And I'm like, wait till we get it in post. And this is the beautiful part when you get in post. This image right here was slightly blurry. And you might have thought, like, when you look at it, you might just throw it away because it's not tack sharp. But anytime you have an image like this where it's kind of telling a story in an implied way, you don't necessarily need tack sharp focus. And in fact, for this image, I almost feel like it's stronger for this particular look with that slight bit of blur behind it. It allows us to focus kind of just on this effect that's going on. It allows us to like focus on the emotion and everything else about the scene rather than having that sharp point right on their faces. Now, I'm not saying to shoot all your images blurry. I'm saying when that happens, you can actually, once you start getting used to it, you can start doing it intentionally and shooting things a little bit blurry or a little bit you know, out of focus just to get that kind of a look. And I found that generally once you get into post-production, what I like to do is flip it to black and white, and then I'll exaggerate the effect along the edges of the image. So I actually exaggerated that out of focus effect along the outsides of the image. So it still kind of pulls attention in the center even though they're not tack sharp there. The black and white kind of takes away from, you know, when you turn an image to black and white, it allows us to focus more on the overall, I don't know, I guess the emotion of the image rather than certain technical details like color and sharpness, which I, I find that whenever something's in color, I'm looking at color and sharpness before I look at anything else. So love that look to that. Also, one little tip. It's really fun to play with flares when you get this kind of a setup. And this is how you do it. A flare is basically where we allow part of the flash to essentially peek through the background. So if our subject is here and the flash is directly behind them, I might move in just a little bit where that flash just peeks out just a little bit from the couple and then fire the shot. Now, a couple things to note with a flare. Oftentimes they're very much overdone, okay? Flares are great when they're done in a minimalistic type of approach and they're not done kind of all the time and done in an over the top way. Flares can become distracting when they're done that way because basically what a flare is gonna do, it's gonna wash out contrast and create a highlight point right where that flare is and that highlight point is gonna draw attention in. So for example, if I put a flare in the corner of the frame and my couple's right here, my eyes automatically go to the corner of the frame where the flare is because it's the brightest place. But if I use the flare kind of creatively, maybe place it right between them, maybe place it right here in the corner where the hair is, then I can draw attention visually into the image, create kind of a cool washed out effect and an interesting look by just moving a little bit with the camera and just kind of shifting and allowing some of that natural flare in. When you block the flash completely, when basically my subject, so here's the flash, when my subject blocks the flash completely and there is no flare, then we end up with a very high contrast and very saturated image. When there is a flare, it's gonna wash out and desaturate the image basically, okay? And it's gonna reduce a little bit of the sharpness too. So just kinda keep in mind what those effects have. All right, so that's it for this tutorial. I want you all to take this effect, take this look, and go out and just absolutely amaze and wow your clients. And do the before and after image so you can show them in camera just how awesome you are.